I don't know if you are aware, most likely you all are, but this past week marked the beginning of a, what do you call it, a new presidency, a new term of presidency? I don't know, but you know what I'm saying. I don't know how you feel about our new president. Um, I don't know how you feel or felt about our previous president. Actually, for quite a few of you, I know how you feel. Um, you, you've spoken your mind one way or the other. Um, but you know what? However you feel, I think, I think you would agree with me that um, Jesus' word is still true yesterday, today, and forever. And so I just want to recall and remember what Jesus said when he was brought before Pilate. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I believe that to be true when he said it 2,000 years ago. And I believe that it is still true today. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And you might think, oh, you know what? But that's Jesus. You know, Jesus can say that. He's not the one who has to live here in this world today and deal with all that's going on. So then what about the believers? Right? What about the believers? What is it that believers should believe and think and hold on to after Jesus has returned to heaven. What do they do? What did the believers do when they faced a government that was at odds with their faith? Well, first of all, they prayed. They prayed. And in their prayers, they remembered the words of King David. They, re they In their prayers, they recall the words of King David who said this in Psalm chapter two, why do the nations rage? and the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords for us. They remember these words of King David that said, it's in vain that the world would rebel against God. And then following that, this is what they prayed. In Acts chapter four, we see this prayer. They say they prayed for truly, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So everything that's happening, things that are for our faith, things that are against our faith, the Lord purposed it. The Lord purposed it. He determined for it to happen to be done. Then they went on to pray this. Now, Lord, look on their threats. If you remember, they were being prohibited from preaching the gospel. And so the disciples, the Christians, the early church, they prayed. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may what? Grant your servants all boldness that they may storm the Sanhedrin gatherings and, and protest what was being said to them? No, they prayed, now look on their threats, Lord, and grant to your servants that with all boldness, they may speak your word. Acts chapter four, the early church being persecuted by the ruling parties, being persecuted by those in charge, even the religious leaders, their prayer was not, Lord, deal with them and take them out of you know the position of power, but Lord, give us boldness that we would continue to speak your word. That's what we are doing here. This is what Porsche Light is about. We are here to continue to seek the Lord and to continue to speak God's word. And so we pray too. We pray too that, and, and you know, we pray on Monday nights. We pray all the time, we hope. But on Monday nights, we gather together and we pray together. And so it, it, this happens on Zoom. And so if those, so most of you that are here, join us for prayer already. But for those who aren't able to, if you can, if you have the time to, Join us together and pray with us. And let's focus as a church, continue to focus on what's important. The world's going to keep going. One ruler after, not ruler, one president after another is going to come in and go out. Good ones, bad ones, they're all good in their ways and they're all bad in their ways. It doesn't matter. The kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. We need to focus and continue to focus on what is important. And that's all I'm going to say about politics. If that's it, beginning of the year, new president, we're done. Um, 
back to our regularly scheduled programming, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 3. But before we turn there, um, can you turn with me in your Bibles, please? Turn with me to Psalm chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51, and the heading, the heading of the psalm says this. Most likely you have it in your Bible also. Cold fingers cannot feel Bible pages. Psalm chapter 51, uh, the heading says this, a psalm of David, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. You know what happened with David, right? He, he saw Bathsheba, this other man's wife. He lusted after her and he went into her and got her pregnant and then he devised for her husband to be killed on the front lines of battle so that he could take her for his own wife. Not a good thing, a very bad thing to have happened in David's life. And this psalm was written after Nathan, the prophet, had gone into David and confronted him about his sin. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4. Read along with me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. This was David's psalm of repentance. He has he is racked with guilt. He is weighed down with remorse. It was at this moment, it, it, this is a scary thing. Before Nathan the prophet came to talk to David, he was going about life like this was a perfectly normal and okay thing to do. Think about that. Killing a man to take his wife. And David's like, I'm the king. I get to do, I mean, talk about bad rulers, right? It wasn't until Nathan came and spoke to him and, and through the Spirit of God that David was convicted, that he realized what he had done. That's a scary thing. But here, here in this moment, his eyes were open to see what he's done. And he writes in verse 4, he says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. When he says against you, God, right, he's speaking to God, against you, you only have I sinned. Does he mean that he didn't sin against Bathsheba or against her husband Uriah? Absolutely not. He's not saying I didn't sin against these people, but that at the root of his offense against Bathsheba and Uriah is his disobedience against God. That is sin. That is the, the root of his action is this, this obedience to God's word. And that is his sin. So he can say, against you, you only have I sinned. I hurt these people, yes, but my disobedience was to you, God. And he says here that in his sin, this is the interesting thing. The reason why we're looking at this, because it ties into what Romans chapter 3 says. He says, in my sin... I've done this evil in your sight, and in doing so, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so what is David saying here? Because I sinned, God, I proved you right. Because I sinned, when the day comes that you judge all mankind for their sins, you are going to be found on the right side of the law because if, if I didn't sin, then you can't say all oh, have sinned. And so in my sin, God, I've proved you right. I've, I've made it so that when you judge, you are just in judging. Have you ever, have you ever uh, prejudged someone? I think there's a word for that, right? To prejudge, what is a noun of prejudge? Prejudice. Right? Prejudice is when you already assume something about someone without knowing the true circumstances. Now, nowadays when we speak of prejudice, we often think of racial prejudice. But I think there's a different kind of prejudice where you just assume, oh, you know what, so-and-so, if I assign him this task, he's going to mess it up. 
if I ask Jonathan to, I don't know, wash the dishes, he's going to forget and just leave it there till morning, right? Not that he does, but just as an example, we assume that someone's going to do something wrong. We assume that they're going to mess up. We assume they're going to make a mistake. We assume they can't do something right. We, we assume, we assume, right? That's to prejudge. And if that person does make that mistake, then I would be right in how I prejudge them. But if that person, and in my life I do this a lot, and that person actually follows through and does what they're supposed to do, then I am made a fool. And so that's why I don't say what I think, because I would like to remain a fool just in my mind. I'm the only one that knows what's going on in here. I'm the only one that feels foolish. You don't need to know. But here's the thing. David here, he's saying, when I sin, God, you've already judged me before, before the foundations of the earth. You knew. So when I sin, I've made you right. I've made you correct. And if you need to move under the tarp, you may. Move, move the uh, power bank over a little bit. And so this is what this is what David says here. He says that in my sin, you've proven, I've proven, Lord, that you are right. And so if you remember, if you remember in the previous chapter, in Romans chapter 3, what we're going to read this morning, David quotes, David quotes Paul here in Romans chapter 3. Okay. Remember in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, Paul has shown that the Jews even though they knew the law, right? The Jews, even though they knew the law, they have broken the law themselves, even though they knew the law and they judge others by the law. And so Paul has already shown that the Jews themselves are not, are not blameless. They, they have sinned, right? And so here, here, what Paul continues to speak on in chapter three is um, he, he's speaking to those Jews who, in knowing the law, look, nobody can follow the law perfectly. We know that, right? But what Paul is speaking to is those who know the law, who break the law, and still choose not to repent, still choose not to offer sacrifices of atonement for their sins. And so turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Verse 3, Paul writes this. For what if some, he's speaking to the Jews and of the Jews. What if some did not believe? What if some did not believe? Now God gave his promises to the Jewish people, to the Jewish nation. They are his chosen people, every single one of them. But Paul says here, what if some did not believe? Because there are Jews that chose not to listen to God. They are Jewish by heritage, by inheritance, but they chose not to listen to God. What if some did not believe, Paul writes, Romans 3.3, 3, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? I mean, after all, God promised to Abraham that he is going to save his descendants. And so there's, there's now a contradiction. God made a promise. Does those who do not believe make God's faith of no effect. Those who died in the wilderness, remember, those who died in the wilderness because they doubted God, would, are they, they couldn't enter the promised land. Did God break his promise when he said, I will take you out of bondage and bring you into the promised land? Verse 4, Paul answers his own question. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written. And this is where he quotes David now that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. You know, in the Psalms, in the Psalms, David writes, he says that, God, you may be blameless when you judge. Paul here, he quotes it with a twist. Did you notice that? He actually says that, God, that you may overcome when you are judged. Kind of like if you imagine Paul, the way he's writing is people are judging God. People are judging God saying, you said, this you, you said that you know all would be under judgment well here i am without sin well no god will overcome those statements when people judge him because we all have sinned 
So God was right after all. Right. So verse 5, verse 5, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, so if in our sin we prove God right, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? Look, God, I'm making you look good in my sin. So why are you then angry with me for my sin? I'm doing you a favor. And then Paul puts in the parentheses, you, you have that too in your Bible. I speak as a man. This is a question that is so preposterous that Paul says, I am speaking as a common man. I'm just asking this as someone who doesn't know any better. Because it is, I don't want to use the word dumb, but it's, it's not a good question. But Paul answers it again. He, he, here's his take on it. Verse 6, certainly not, for then how will God judge the world? The judgment is coming. Paul has every assurance that judgment is coming. How is God going to judge the world if he has to look on each of us in our sin and say, well, thank you for making me look good, Jonathan. You've done a especially good job of it. <laughs> this can't be. God will judge. The judgment is coming. And so then Paul goes on to say this. For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? He's continuing that train of thought. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come? Right? Why not just keep sinning so that more, more, more credit would be given to God? Then he says this, as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say. So people have been accusing Paul of saying this very thing, that in our sin... We should continue to sin because God looks good in our sin. He's made correct in our sin. Then he concludes that sentence with this. Their condemnation is just. And so Paul doesn't go into doctrine to explain why this is wrong. He simply says the people who say these, these things and accuse us of these things, they are condemned. That's his take on this thought that God because you are made righteous when I sin, then I should sin all the more. Paul slams the lid shut on that argument with people who think this and say that we think this are condemned. End of discussion. Okay, so, so, we cannot, we cannot try to explain away or justify our sin. We cannot try to say our sin makes God look good. So since, since we can't just explain away our sin, the question then is, what is so bad about sin? Right? We can't disregard sin, so we need to ask, what is so bad about sin? Right? As, as Christians, we believe in the gospel. We believe in the good news. And as we looked at last week, when there's good news, there's a bad news that needs to be counteracted. And so we all believe doctrinally at least, that we are all born in sin. Is, is there anyone this morning who believes that we're not sinners? I hope not, right? So we all believe doctrinally that we are sinners. We are all born sinners. We accept the idea of it. But how many of us are made aware, are, are just aware of how, what it means to be sinful? Let's look at Paul's exposition on sin here in chapter 3. In chapter 3 from verse 10 to 18, Paul brings a bunch of different scriptures from different Psalms, from Proverbs, from Isaiah. He brings them all together into this treatise on sin. He starts in verse 10. He writes this, There is none righteous. No, not one. Right? He doesn't say most people, in fact, 99.999999% of people are bad, but there's a small handful that are good. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. There's not a single one of us who's good, not a single one of us who's righteous. We do not have a natural tendency to seek after God. That's why we pray, Lord, give me a heart that desires you. Give me a heart that longs for you because naturally by my own flesh, I don't want God. I think we would all agree, if left to our own devices, we don't desire the Lord. 
we don't have a tendency to want to seek God, and we're pretty much good for nothing. Right? It, it's, it's kind of a depressing thought, but we're good for nothing. Verse 13, their throat is an empty tomb, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Okay, so now Paul is getting into a little more detail about what it means to be sinful. Um, how many of you, how many of uh, us here, have you, how many of us have managed to hurt somebody with our words? I think we all have to some extent. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's when we break our trust, uh, break someone's trust with a lie. That's how we hurt people. Um, sometimes we know just the right thing to say to kind of get at someone's insecurities or, or open an old emotional wound. Um, we, we, are, we are very good with our words and in a not good way. Right? We, we know how to hurt people. Um, sometimes it's just plain being unkind. Sometimes it's, you know, being a little bit too harsh or more harsh and needed. Um, maybe it's fits of rage and anger. I don't know. I don't know what your brand of um, hurtful words is, but there's a natural tendency in many of us, maybe most of us, to cause damage with our words. That's sin. That comes from sin. Let's go on. Verses 15 to 18. It gets worse now. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay. So you're thinking, okay, I, I, I can take not having a desire toward God. I, I can accept that. I can take maybe saying hurtful words and, and being mean. But their feet are swift to shed blood. Jason, okay, that's, that's too much. You've gone, this is extra, right? We're, none of us here are like this. None of us can say that destruction or misery are in our ways. Story time. Last week, remember I shared about how I tricked one of my friends and got him in trouble, um, you know, just to get myself out of trouble. I think that was maybe second or third grade, I can't remember. But it was when I was in Taiwan. There was a, another incident. I was a very troubled child. There was another incident from when I was in preschool. Um, I remember, I remember a, a handful of things that happened in preschool. This was one of them. One particular recess, a bunch of us were out in the schoolyard and we had discovered some weird kind of bug. I don't remember what it looked like, but there was some kind of bug and we all wanted to look at it. And it was crawling on, on these pavers, these, these you know stepping stones. And they were not the nice smooth pavers. They were jagged, real rocks. And this bug was crawling and we were all crowded around. It's like, oh, look at that, look at that. And then the bug fell or got between the cracks, uh, between the pavers. And so now it's hard to see because it's not out in plain sight. And so, you know, somebody decided that he was going to get a closer look. So he stuck his head over to look in the crack. Guess whose view he blocked? Mine. I could no longer see the bug. So a preschooler, a preschooler. You know what I did? I did the only natural thing that you would do when somebody blocks your line of sight. You say, excuse me, can you move? No, I put my hand on the back of his head and in my mind I thought, you want to look? Get a closer look. And I shoved his face into the paver. I don't remember what happened afterwards. I probably <laughs> got into trouble. But I remember that in that moment, I mean, it's a bug. We were looking at it, and in that moment, this rage, and the kids are like, now, now I understand where dad gets his anger from. Right? This rage is boiled up, and I smash his face. Now, I don't know if he got badly hurt, because, you know, as I've said before, I'm not that strong. Yes, you are, Dad. And so, I mean, I'm a preschool kid. I can't do that much damage. But the point is that there was this urge for destruction, right? 
Their feet are swift to shed blood. Maybe he got a bloody nose. That's still blood, right? Even at a young age. And I hadn't, you know, it's not like I was watch, I was brought up on violent movies. And, and you know, I, it wasn't like I was a kid who, kid who tended to get in trouble and fight. But just the, our natural self, that sinful self, something in there woke up in that moment and, and hurt the other kid. That's, that's us. That's sin. It's in each and every one of us. Some worse than others. Maybe none of you have smashed people's faces into the ground. But we've all maybe at moments had a, a, a wanting to strangle someone maybe. Right? And in our anger. And... It's our natural inclination to deviate from God's laws. Now, that's not something that comes immediately to mind when we say that we're all sinners in the need of the grace of God. Because right? that's an easy thing to say. As Christians, we all say it and we can all agree with each other and nod and say amen. It rolls right off our tongues, right? Oh, I, I am the chief of sinners. And we say it so easily and the worst of it is we say it and we don't even realize how rotten we are inside. Here's what Paul writes in, in, later on in chapter 3, verse 23. He writes this, All have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But not all of us can see how much we've fallen short of the glory of God. Right? Remember, even King David. King David, who... God said was a man after my own heart. This was God's stamp of approval on David. Here is a man after my own heart. He slept with someone else's wife, killed her husband, and didn't think there was anything wrong with that. That's how blind we all can be to what it means when it says that we are all sinners and we have all sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. Even David himself was blind to his own transgressions until God convicted him and opened his eyes to see just what kind of a man he was. Nathan the prophet, I, I believe the Spirit of God was on him. Nathan the prophet came in and, and spoke to David and, and told him a story. Right here, here's a you know here's a man, a very poor man. He has just one little sheep, and he he loves his sheep. Here's his neighbor who has a ton of he's big farm, lots of animals. But that neighbor wanted this one neighbor's little sheep, and so took that sheep and slaughtered it. And he asked David, "So what do you think should be done to this man?" And David was angry. He said, "That man should be done away with." Right, even at that point, he didn't realize. It's like, Nathan, good story. I, I'm in agreement with you. And then Nathan said, that's you. You have so much at your disposal. And then you came to Uriah and his one precious wife, his beloved wife, and you took her away, and then you did away with him. And it, was, it wasn't until the Spirit came and convicted David, and the Lord spoke through Nathan, that David's, I mean, when, we, when I read that, when you read that, it's like, how can this be? How can a person be in such darkness? But we all are. That's the thing. We all are in this darkness. And we all need the work of revelation by the Holy Spirit to show us what is inside. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we all need the Holy Spirit to help us see ourselves for who we are. I want to end this morning. I was end this morning. I was wondering if we could all read together from another psalm. If you can, turn to Psalm 139. Read together from Psalm 139. We're going to read verses 1 to 7 and then 23 to 24. Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, ye have searched me and known me. Ye know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path 
and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Ye have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Not that I hope any one of us this morning would want to go away from God's spirit. Not that we would ever want to flee from his presence. But we cannot. In verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I'd like to close in prayer. But as we do, perhaps we can take a moment to just come before the Lord in quietness. Come before God and ask Him this morning to search you to search you, to know your heart. Ask the Lord this morning, is there any wicked way in me? And be prepared for the Lord to answer. Be ready to listen. Be ready for him to lead you in the way everlasting. Let's bow our heads and just spend some time before the Lord. Jesus, each and every one of us this morning here, we know, we acknowledge that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That even when we were in the womb, Lord, as you knit us together, you know every detail about us. You know every nook and cranny. You know every thought, Lord, every desire the ones that are good and the ones that are not so good. And I pray this morning, Lord, as we come before you, that you would search us, Lord, and know our hearts and speak to us, Lord, if there is some wicked way in us. so that we can write our path and follow after you, Lord, with all our heart. It's never too late, Lord, to turn back around. It's never too late to acknowledge and confess our sins. Help us, Lord, and create in us a clean heart. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.